For this video, we're looking at Thomas Wyatt's They Flee From Me, which is an outstanding poem. Um, it's quite short, but there's an awful lot to notice and think about and talk about here. So we're going to use this um, and go through and, and annotate it to really try to give you a sense of how to go about doing a sort of close reading, um, focusing on a, on a short bit of text and really digging in and paying attention to the details and thinking about them. They flee from me that sometime did me seek with naked foot stalking in my chamber. I have seen them gentle, tame, and meek, and now are wild and do not remember that sometime they put themselves in danger to take bread at my hand, and now they range, busily seeking with a continual change. Think to be fortune it hath been otherwise, twenty times better, but once in special, in thin array after a pleasant guise, when her loose gown from her shoulders did fall, and she me caught in her arms long and small, Therewithal sweetly did me kiss, and softly said, Dear heart, how like you this? It was no dream, I lay broad waking, but all is turned through my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking, and I have leave to go of her goodness, and she also to use new fangleness. But since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. Okay, so a lot going on there. So we're looking at three stanzas, right? We start just thinking about the structure. We've got three short stanzas. They're each seven lines long. So this is a short lyric poem. It is kind of about love, but it's not a sonnet, right? Um, so we already know it's a little bit of a different structure than some of the other poems we've been looking at. And let's, you know, sort of focus um, one stanza at a time here. So they flee from me that sometime did me seek with naked foot stalking in my chamber. So right off the bat, we probably want to think about, well, who's the they, right? Um, they flee from me. So we've got some different pronouns going on here. So there's a speaker and there's a they that's, that flee from the speaker. I have seen them gentle, tame, and meek, and now are wild and do not remember that sometime they put themselves in danger to take bread at my hand. Okay, so we're talking about some kind of animals here. Um, gentle, tame, and meek, take bread at my hand. So, you know, some kind of gentle, tame, uh, woodland creature of some kind, right? We can kind of imagine... Um, you know, squirrels or, or birds or deer. Um, deer, I think, will make sense too when going uh, into the second stanza. So deer might be a particularly helpful way to think about that. But for now, we could just do, you know, woodland creatures. Um, and then those adjectives, right? Gentle, tame, meek. Now they're wild. Okay, so there's these woodland creatures, they flee from me, right? And obviously this is a, this is a metaphor. Um, it seems pretty clear when looking at the poem as a whole that these woodland creatures are actually women. Um, so they could be you know, deer, squirrels, some kind of woodland creatures, but it's really a metaphor for women. Now, it's interesting to think about what's going on here, right? They flee from me that sometime did me seek with naked foot stalking in my chamber. So stalking obviously has a lot of connotation nowadays besides just, you know, a kind of movement. Um, and it may very well have back then too, I, you know, definitely because we're thinking in terms of animals at the moment, we could think about how a, a predator stalks its prey, right? It, it sort of tries to sneak up on its prey um, to, to quietly follow it, stalking it until it's able to go in for the kill, right? Um, so even if we don't know exactly the connotations of stalking in the period, that's a really interesting verb, you know? I, I think we could note that um, 
that's a really evocative, interesting verb, stalking. But now it's interesting. So we're talking about these woodland creatures, deer or something that flee from me. And who's actually doing the stalking, right? Because we're talking about woodland creatures with naked foot, it sounds like it's the they that are doing the stalking. And, and, you know, that makes sense if we're just thinking about stalking as a way of describing the movement of certain kinds of animals or something like that. But it's also, they flee from me that sometimes did me seek. So we've got uh, poetic grammar there, you know, that sometimes I did seek. With naked foot, stalking in my chamber. So here, right, there's no punctuation that's coming um, at the end of the first line. And so it's really ambiguous whether it's the, the woodland creatures that are fleeing with naked foot or if it's me, right? They flee from me that sometime did me seek, that sometime I did seek with naked foot. So is that me with naked foot stalking them? Is that them with naked foot stalking around my chamber? Chamber's bedroom, by the way. Um, around my chamber, um, who's doing the stalking and who has the naked foot and why? Bedroom there. So there's potentially a lot going on here, right? Um, and they sometimes put themselves in danger. That's interesting. So they are gentle, tame, meek. They take bread at my hand. They put themselves in danger. So there's a sense here, you know, there's a kind of threat. And and now they range, right? Now they sort of roam about the countryside or something. Um, so we're going to come back to some of this as we, as we keep going. But those are some things we might notice and start thinking about already, right? Think be fortunate, hath been otherwise, 20 times better, but once in special. So the first stanza is many. Second stanza, we're getting down to one, right? It was the they that flee from me, and now there's one in particular. So think be fortunate, hath been otherwise, 20 times better, once in special, in thin array after a pleasant guise. So pleasantly dressed. Um, when her loose gown from her shoulders did fall, and she me caught in her arms long and small, therewithal sweetly did me kiss, and softly said, Dear heart, how like you this. So her gown was falling off her shoulders. We can probably assume that she's at least partially naked here. And it ends with, Sweetly did me kiss, and dear heart, how, you, how like you this. That seems um, like it's it's a pretty good uh, implication that this isn't going to end with kissing, right? That there's actual sex being implied here that's just not super clearly stated. But we've got nudity and kissing seems to just be the beginning of this, right? So the loose gown and the sweetly did me kiss. And here again, we've got that um, poetic grammar. So therewith sweetly did me kiss, therewith sweetly did kiss me, right? This is her doing the kissing, um, did me kiss. The, so the grammar is sort of out of order how we would normally say that. And softly said, dear heart, how like you this? So that's what she is saying to him, um, this one special woman. Right? And it's real, real clear the woodland creatures are women, and this is one particular woman. Um, once in special, 20 times better. Uh, maybe let's come back to that. Let's come back to that. Uh, one other thing we might note here Dear Heart is a, is a version of a really common sort of pun wordplay in early modern poetry because heart. H-A-R-T is another word for deer, right? D-E-E-R. Uh, did I say two E's or three? Um, D-E-E-R, that kind of deer, right? The woodland creature deer. 
And a heart is another word for that. And so frequently, you know, deer and heart get used uh, to, to sort of a double meaning of, you know, a deer, a woodland creature kind of deer, and deer in, in the case of a beloved, right? So deer heart is kind of doubling up on that. It's sort of deer deer. Um, so, so there's a lot of, you know, emphasis there, we might say. Um, emphasis from, let's say, maybe implied repetition. Because it's not, I mean, deer and heart don't have to be a repetition. But I'm I I would make the argument that at least one way could, we could read it is that it is right because of that that really really common bit of wordplay. All right, so we're going to come back to some stuff here too. Let's go on to the last stanza. It was no dream I lay broad waking, but all is turned through my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking. Okay, so here there's a change. There's a but. Right, so there's a kind of turn. And, and so, you know, the implication here is that, is that they broke up, right? Turn, so there's a breakup that, that just um, comes in in these last you know, six lines at the at the end of the short poem, right? But all is turned through my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking. And lively to good of her of her goodness, and also she to use newfangleness. Pause there for a minute. Um, so I have leave to go of her goodness. So she's the one who initiated the breakup. She started so so she started the breakup she broke it off with him right um all is turned through my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking so it's like his gentleness has been it was used against him right into a strange fashion of forsaking forsaking um you know sort of forgetting, doing away with, uh, disregarding, right? So his gentleness has been used against him in a strange fashion of forsaking. And I have leave to go of her goodness. So she, she was of her goodness, gave me leave, broke up with me. And she also to use newfangleness. Now newfangle is a word that still exists. Um, you don't necessarily hear it very often, but it is still a modern English word. So newfangled, if something is newfangled, it's, it's new, um, and it's normally new in a, in a kind of negative way. The connotation of something being newfangled is that it's, it's new in a way that's ultimately bad, that's, that's negative. All right, negative here. Um, you know, so like those newfangled self-driving cars uh, might make it difficult for people to um, enjoy, you know, a drive in the countryside anymore, something like that, right? Where the implication is clearly that what is new is, is a negative. So here, she is using newfangledness. So she's using something new, and it's, and it's kind of bad from the perspective of the speaker. But, here we've got another but. But since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. Now, fain is a really potentially tricky word in early modern English. Um, because it, here, well... I mean, there's, there's kind of two ways, a, a couple different ways you can interpret it, and they're very, very different. 
So in this case, the sort of with the grain reading, I think the, the obvious way to make sense of this is I would like to know what she has deserved, what she deserves, what she has deserved. Um, where fain would mean like. But fain can also mean fake, which if you think about it, you know, fake is, is also a kind of like, but it's a like that is not authentic. Um, so I would pretend to know what she hath deserved would be that implication. So pretend and, you know, I would like to know, I want to know. Those are like uh, almost opposites here. And fain can mean either one. But part of what I think is so clever about this poem is that there are so many of those kinds of ambiguities, the, the little unclear bits that are purposeful, right? That an a, um, experienced poet has chosen to frame it in this way, knowing that it could be interpreted in different ways. Right. And so that gives us all kinds of room for interpretation. I mean, there's there's room anyways, because there's metaphors and imagery and and it's not a straightforward tale of, you know, I used to have a lot of women on my bedroom and then I settled with one and, and really loved her, but she broke up with me. Right. That could have been much more straightforward. It's not. It's a poem and it's a poem for a reason. Um. And so there are all these interesting bits, potential for interpretation. So a couple ways we could go with this, a couple of very different ways, right? I think the with the grain reading, the one that kind of goes along with what I would say the text encourages us to think. Um, it, it encourages us to... I, there are, you know, some potential problems with this, as I'll get to in a moment. But it, it generally, I think, encourages us to sympathize with the speaker, right? And that makes sense, because the speaker is the poetic I. So it, you know, it sort of makes sense that the reader is, is somehow supposed to um, sympathize with the speaker. So, you know, the speaker... Um, is is gentle, but he was forsaken... Um, you know, like he could have, it sounds like he was, he was a good guy. At least he was a good guy in this relationship. And, and she broke up with him and used newfangledness to do it. Um, so she was somehow, you know, sneaky about it or, or particularly cruel or something. So that would all imply that we're supposed to sort of sympathize with the speaker here. And I think that's the with the grain reading. I think that's how the poem kind of encourages us to think and just thinking about this kind of poem, a love poem or a love poem that involves a loss of love, a breaking up, you know, would often want us to sort of identify with the speaker. But we could also come up with a, an against the grain reading. And against the grain is generally tougher. And it's one that, that doesn't always work. That you, you know, the first thing you always want to do when, when interpreting analyzing a, a text like this is to think about the with the grain, what is this text trying to do? What does the text want the reader to think and feel, right? And, and, then, and then how do I know that? What details tell me that? So with the grain is, is much more, um, you know, sort of direct. Uh, I mean, it's not necessarily easy in, in terms of being simple because it's a really complex short poem, but it's easy in terms of figuring out what the poem, you know, wants the reader to think and then sort of going along with that. So an against the grain reading would be different then, right? It's trying to find enough details in the poem that could be pulled together for an alternative to the with the grain reading. So if the with the grain reading is we're sympathizing with the speaker who, you know, used to hang with a bunch of women, found one he really loved, wanted to stick with her. She broke up with him despite his gentleness. It was used against him. Um, and so she dumped him and now he's heartbroken, right? That's the with the grain reading. So against the grain, we have to come up with something different. And this poem, I think, offers enough interesting details and ambiguous details that we could do a good job of that. 
So the stalking, we don't know who's stalking, right? We're talking about woodland creatures. We're talking about naked foot. It kind of sounds like that would be the, the woodland creatures, the, the women. But again, the grammar here is, is not clear. They flee from me that sometimes did me seek with naked foot. So is that I was seeking them with naked foot? I'm stalking them in my chamber? Or that sometimes I did seek them with naked foot? stalking in my chamber, right? So who's doing the stalking? Who has the naked foot? Um, they put themselves in danger. Danger is interesting, right? So there's some kind of threat here. And, and the threat, they put themselves in danger to take bread at my hand. So the threat is taking bread from the speaker that he is offering to feed the woodland creatures. And again, this is a metaphor for women and gifts for them or something like that. But he's saying that the, you know, the, the gifts, the, the, the bread, the metaphor of bread in this case, um, is a threat that they put themselves in danger by doing that. Right. So I think we could read this as this guy's kind of, he's kind of a creep, right? Like he's, you know, talking about stalking women and then putting themselves at danger to, to take things from me, to take gifts, um, that seem to be, you know, for their best interest, but in fact was putting them in danger. So, so in this reading, right, stanza one, eh, maybe the speaker's actually kind of creepy. Maybe we aren't supposed to, to sympathize with him too much. Um, although I, you know, either interpretation, perfectly valid. It's not a matter of coming up with the right answer. We want to come up with the best answer we can think of that we could make a good argument for. All right. Thanked be fortunate have been otherwise 20 times better, but once in special and thin array. So again, the kind of with the grain reading, the, the seemingly obvious way of making sense of this is, you know, thank be fortune that out of 20 times there was this one special one, right? Cause we're going from the many to the one here. So, so thank goodness I did actually get one that was special, right? That seems nice, straightforward enough, pleasant, right? And, and this stanza is talking about a very pleasant, you know, sexual encounter with one particular woman. So, so that sounds okay. But then let's really think about the, the wording here, right? Thanked be fortune, it hath been otherwise... So it hath been otherwise, it hath been different. 20 times better, but once in special. Well, how do we make sense of that? I mean, I think what we were just saying is there were 20 good times, but there was one particular special one. Um, and I think that's perfectly valid. But I also think it'd be perfectly valid to say that the once in special, there were still 20 times that were better than that. Or um, the once in special, you know, the otherwise, like there were other times that were 20 times better, right? 20 times instead of 20 uh, individual instances, you know, multiplying by 20 um, as being that much better. Now, I think the, the first of those, the multiple instances, probably makes more sense here. But it's interesting, 20 times better but once in special. So the better, but once in special. We know the once is special, but the better is not is not the once, right? Um, the once in special is not better because there's a but there. There's an opposition. And so we could say, you know, as opposed to our with the grain reading of thank goodness, you know, thank fortune, thank my luck that I had this one special time, that thank goodness I had 20 times better than this one special time, right? This one special time, this one I'm about to describe to you, thank goodness I had 20 times that worked out better than this. It's a very different reading, but the details, I think, leave that as a possibility, right? The wording, the punctuation, the grammar, it leaves that as a possibility. So here we've got, you know, creeper speaker stalking and, and sort of threatening 
the woodland creatures. Here we've got him saying, you know, there's this one special time, but, but I had 20 times that were better. And, and again, you don't have to go with that reading. I'm just giving you the against the grain interpretation here. And then the last one, it was no dream. I lay broad waking, but all is turned through my gentleness into a strange fashion of forsaking. And I have leave to go of her goodness, but she also to use newfangledness. Since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. Um, right, so the first four lines or so there, his gentleness being used against him, she broke up with him, you know, poor speaker, right? But then here, these last, four, you know, couple lines, um, I think we could read these in, in other ways, right? But since that I so kindly, so the bud is setting up another opposition, right? But since that I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. So I so kindly am served. Does it sound like he was served kindly? No, his gentleness was used against him, right? And so I think if we wanted to, we could read this as you know, bitter and ironic, right? But since that I so kindly am served, since she did me so well and treated me so wonderfully, right? Like you could just have it like dripping with, with sarcasm, irony, bitterness. I would fain know what she hath deserved. I'd like to know what she deserved. I'd like to know where she ended up, right? We could, we could read this real bitter, and, and angry, right? I'd like to know what happened to her um, or if she got what she deserved, right? I would fain know what she hath deserved. I would like to know what she hath deserved or I would pretend to know what she hath deserved because remember, fain can be two very, very different interpretations. And so what she hath deserved, you know, like, what does that mean? Is that like, oh, he was wanting the best for her after she broke his heart? Or is it, you know, she used my gentleness against me. And since I so kindly am served, I would fain know what she hath deserved. And I want to know if she got it. I want to know if she got what she deserved, right? There could be a real mean, nasty bitterness here that would be very, very different from sympathetic speaker with his heart broken. And I think, you know, the details in the poem allow for both of those possibilities. And there are, there are other ones too. It's not like there's only two ways to interpret these things. But there's always going to be a with the grain reading, right? There's always going to be a way of thinking about what does the text encourage the reader to think or feel, there's not always going to be a good against the grain reading because sometimes there's just not enough details that seem to sort of complicate or undermine the with the grain reading. So against the grain is is harder and it's it's rarer. But but there's always multiple ways to interpret everything, right? So we've just gone over a couple, and and for some of these we went over you know more than two. Um, but two ways to sort of put it all together into an analytical argument, right? A way of reading the entire poem, either as sympathetic, heartbroken speaker or nasty, bitter, creepy speaker um, full of hate, right? So so we, we put together interpretations in a couple of different ways. And the point is here, we're not trying to come up with the right answer. We're not trying to come up with the correct interpretation, we're trying to figure out the one that we can make the best argument for. I can make a good case for this. And I think with this poem, we could make a good case for either one, right? We could make a good case for the with the grain, sympathetic speaker. There's some weird details that, that are weird in that context, but ultimately that seems to be the thrust of the poem. And, or I think we could make a good argument that the speaker that the speaker is actually bitter and nasty and creepy and um uh you know maybe we aren't supposed to really sympathize with him <laughs> like maybe he's you know he's just really bitter and nasty and we're we're supposed to be aware of that or or notice it in some way 
right? So different possibilities, different interpretive possibilities when you go through and analyze. Um, and, and just notice how we mark this up. There are lots of things I sort of underlined, but I didn't end up writing anything in the margins, right? That was so I could sort of come back to certain details. But if we were going to put together a close reading analysis and, and write a short paper close reading this, then I'd be able to look at my evidence that I've marked in the text and then pull that into my paragraphs in the essay, making that argument for, you know, this is, this is how I think we ought to read the text and here's why. It's not, it's not the correct answer, but it's, it's the best answer I can come up with. And I think you should read it the same way. And here's why, right? So making an analytical argument there.